Hello everyone, um, my name is Steph and today I'm going to be talking to you about pseudoarchaeology and gender. Really what I'm going to be doing is giving you just a brief introduction to a very understudied topic. Um, I'm not exaggerating when I say I couldn't find anything when I went looking for uh, specific articles or, or book chapters even um, about pseudoarchaeology and gender. It's a conversation I've had with many folks on social media, um, but so far, to the best of my knowledge, nobody's actually um, pursued it further. And I think it's an area worthy of so much research and, and needing more attention. So I'm just gonna give you a brief introduction, mostly to what pseudo-archeology span is. I want you to have those tools to be able to understand what you're seeing uh, or critically analyze, I should say, what you're seeing, what you're reading, what you're hearing. Um, and then you can take those tools and apply it to more gender, sexuality specific um, articles, books, TV shows, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm gonna give you at the end too, some suggestions on areas that I think you could go if you wanted to study pseudo-archeology span and gender, um, things that I think would be interesting questions to ask uh, or, or things that are in need of more attention. Um, so that is kind of what we'll be going over today. Now to briefly introduce you to myself. Um, I'm not turning on my camera because I just, I'm having issues. I use an external camera, I'm having issues with it today. Anyway, who am I? I'm a PhD student in the Institute of Prairie and Indigenous Archaeology at U Alberta. We're in the Department of Anthropology. Uh, I've been an archaeologist in Canada for over 10 years now. That includes the time I spent working on my degrees. Um, and I've also worked in, in Southern Spain. And my PhD research is focused on the use of pseudo-archaeology in archaeology itself uh, by far-right conspiritual groups and individuals in North America. So conspirituality, if you're not aware of the term, refers to ideologies or beliefs that are built from combining spirituality, largely New Age spirituality, with conspiracy theories. Most of my focus is on a historic conspiritual organization in BC called the Aquarian Foundation, led by a guy named, or who called himself Brother 12. They were out in BC uh, from 1927 to 1933. And I'm also comparing Brother 12's conspirituality to contemporary groups like subsections of, of QAnon are, are very conspiritual. Um, but I'm interested in looking at similarities and differences over this nearly 100 year time period. Are the methods the same? The messages different? Are the messages the same? The methods different? That kind of thing. So let's jump into it. What is pseudo-archaeology? Goes by many different terms. Um, I think pseudo-archaeology is the one we use most often, but I've also heard fantastic archaeology, cult archaeology, um, alternative archaeology, my personal favorite, bullshit archaeology, but you don't hear that one very often. And so how I define pseudo-archaeology is as a form of discovery paranormalism that gives us uh, or, or suggests speculative and alternative claims about human history. And they rely on matter of faith rather than matter of proof by willfully and deliberately downplaying or ignoring contradictory archeological knowledge under the guise of a concept called stigmatized knowledge, which is what puts pseudo-archeology span into the same realm as conspiracy theories. The too long did not read version, pseudo-archeology span refers to archeological conspiracy theories. Now I took a lot of different resources uh, or borrowed from a lot of different resources, a lot of different researchers to come up with this definition. Um, some are archeologists, some are political scientists, some are sociologists, religious studies scholars, very interdisciplinary. These are some of the folks that I, I borrowed from to come up with this definition. And really this definition can be subdivided into three main parts. And that's what I'm gonna jump into next is how did I come up with, or, or what did I put into this definition for these three parts? Um, I will go over that. So part one, discovery paranormalism. Defining pseudo-archeology span is a form of discovery paranormalism. What is that? Well, starting with Moshenska, uh, and Fader, Mashenska talks about how alternative archaeologies pose hypotheses and narratives of the human past that deviate from the mainstream consensus in a variety of ways. And by mainstream, we refer to, or what we're referring to, I should say, are uh, things that archaeologists have largely agreed upon. Archaeology is always changing with new information. We're always revising uh, what we know, what we think we know. Um, 
but these are alternative archaeologists or pseudo-archaeology deviates from that consensus. And then Fader added a bit more onto it, talking about this deviation, um, is full of unsubstantiated occult and speculative claims being made about the past. So if we were to plot this idea on a graphic, you get kind of, I think what would look like a violin plot you see on the right, where you've got the majority of people, archaeologists and non-archaeologists, um, lumped into the middle there, who, who believe that only humans were involved in human history. But then at either end, you've got people who argue in what's called ancient alien theory or sometimes ancient astronaut theory. Um, they argue that extraterrestrials were involved in human history. At the other end, you have these hyperdiffusionist theories they're referred to, um, which means like uh, one culture had a significant influence on another culture with great distance between them. Um, Theories about Atlantis, for example, are very popular here, or other mythical continents like Omeria and Mu. Ultimately, um, at this end of the spectrum, it's still people who are arguing that people were not responsible for their own history. It boils down to that. So Anderson and Card are the ones who first talked about this idea of discovery paranormalism being related to pseudo-archaeology. Um, and they pulled from Bader, Baker, and Mencken's work. Um, Bader, Baker, and Mencken are, I think, sociologists, religious study scholars at Chapman University who've written a lot about paranormal phenomena. Um, and they define paranormal phenomena as beliefs, practices, and experiences that are not recognized by science and not associated with mainstream religion. Um, they run, or I don't know if they still run it, they used to run what was called the Chapman Survey of American Fears. They used to run this every year. And a section of that survey was specifically about paranormal activity. Um, and as of 2018, which I believe was the last year that this, at least this section of the survey was run, 75, 76% of Americans believed in at least one paranormal phenomenon. Bader, Baker and Mencken, they talk about how there are two types of paranormalism, enlightenment and discovery. Um, the appeal of enlightenment, they say, is to learn about oneself, to become a better person, maybe. And the appeal of discovery is to share in an adventure, to feel the thrill of searching for the unknown, and perhaps to be the one who finally brings in the proof of the unknown. That's what discovery paranormalism is. And that's what uh, Jeb Card and David Anderson suggest we uh, consider when we're talking about pseudo-archaeology because this idea of being the one who finds the proof is a really important part of pseudo-archaeology. It's something you see in all these shows that are, are produced or books, uh, these teams or these individuals are the ones looking for the proof. But as we'll discuss in a moment, proof can be different things. Sometimes it's not a physical thing. Um, sometimes it's that idea of, of faith or just believing in something is the only proof you need. So anyway, that is how I came up with the first part of this definition. The second part is talking about uh, claims relying on matter of faith rather than matter of proof and willful and deliberate downplaying or ignoring of contradictory archeological knowledge. So a lot of this section came from Garrett Fagan's book. Uh, he wrote in 2006, a book called Archeological Fantasies. Very, very good book for um, learning about pseudo-archaeology, especially learning about how to identify pseudo -arch. So like, what are the characteristics of it? His book is great. I'm a big fan of it. Um, and he really built a lot of his discussion on these characteristics off of uh, William Stephen Jr., who had mentioned that pseudo-archaeology had three main characteristics. So ultimately, they don't like the scientific method. Um, Pseudo-archaeology tends to provide very simple answers to big complex issues. And it also has this tendency to present itself as being persecuted by or at odds with the archeological establishment. Um, archeologists are often referred to as the mainstream. That's kind of a keyword we see a lot. And just as a bit of an example of that presenting itself as being persecuted, we've got a quote from Graham Hancock's book. Uh, Graham Hancock is a very well-known pseudo-archeologist who proposes that um, over 13,000 years ago, this very highly advanced culture or civilization, as he calls them, uh, existed on earth and encoded this special knowledge into structures all around the world that if you know how to decode it, then you get access to the special knowledge. Sounds a lot like Atlantis. He says it's not Atlantis. I don't really know. 
Anyway, he writes that for more than half a century, as we've seen, American archaeology was so riddled with preformed opinions on how the past should look, it was about the orderly, linear way in which civilization should evolve, that it repeatedly missed, sidelined, and downright ignored evidence. That's something that um, a lot of the books, the pseudo-art books and shows and websites and YouTube videos will try to point out is this opposition from the mainstream. And we'll get more into that in more detail in a little bit. So now moving on to this idea of faith as proof. Michael Barkin, political scientist, has done some really wonderful work on conspiracy theories, and I'll be talking a lot about him in a, in a bit. Um, he points out that turning belief into a matter of faith rather than matter of proof protects conspiracy theorists from potentially disastrous effects of contradicting evidence. So conspiracy theorists are in this case pseudo-archaeologists, more often than not don't like to change their mind in the face of contradictory evidence. They just sort of revise it in such a way that fits into that narrative they already have. Um, and in many cases, it's this matter of faith rather than matter of proof. So the faith becomes all the proof that they need um, that helps kind of protect them from that potential contradiction or helps them revise it and fit it into their narratives. And again, a quote from Graham Hancock, uh, his book, Fingerprints of the Gods, which is probably his most famous novel. Um, and he says straight up, I go on intuition again, not on evidence. And so back to Fagan, he points out that the pseudo-archaeologist can only be defined as such when he or she willfully ignores countervailing data instead of rethinking their position. Um, or in, in other words, they deliberately ignore it or, or leave it unexplored because they're worried about how that might change this narrative that they're trying, the pseudo-archaeological narrative or theory that they're trying to present. Um, and these are done intentionally. That's key. It's done intentionally. And that is all that went into the second part of this definition, looking at claims that rely on matter of faith rather than matter of proof and willful and deliberate ignorance or, or downplaying of knowledge. Um, and in the next section, the final section about stigmatized knowledge, I think you'll see all of these kind of come together and, and complete this, this circle. So stigmatized knowledge. Um, this ignorance and deliberate downplaying of contradictory archaeological knowledge is done under a guise of stigmatized knowledge, a concept called stigmatized knowledge, um, which is what places pseudo-archaeology into the same realm as conspiracy theories. And to me, this is the most important part of pseudo-archaeology. This is what differentiates pseudo-archaeology from just misinterpretations. Um, you know, maybe based on the evidence that has been uncovered so far, a certain interpret interpretation has come about, turns out to be wrong. That's just a misinterpretation. But pseudo-archaeology is very intentional. So it was John Hoops who, who sort of first pointed out that pseudo-archaeology represents a cultic milieu or a community based on stigmatized knowledge. And this concept of stigmatized knowledge comes from Michael Barkin, who I just previously introduced you to. And he defines conspiracy theories as modes of thinking that seek to give the appearance of order to events. Um, and the conspiracist worldview relies on three main principles. Regardless of what the conspiracy theory is, they all adhere to these principles. Nothing happens by accident, nothing is as it seems, and everything is connected. And so he points out that conspiracy theories are often at odds with official or widely accepted explanations, much like pseudo-archaeologists at odds with mainstream archaeology. They resist falsification by reducing highly complex events or phenomena to simplistic causes, also like pseudo-archaeology. Um, and complex events are, are generally explained by a singular plot or a set of plots. Um, and the truth of that plot is in the special knowledge that conspiracy theorists hold. This idea of holding special knowledge is part of what makes conspiracy theories so um, attractive and hard to break people out of, because you feel like you're part of something special. And just on the right is um, a conspiracy theory chart that I, I really enjoy. Abby Richards has done a lot of really great work, um, especially related to TikTok, conspiracy theories on TikTok. And she came out with this chart originally many years ago. Um, came out with a 2021 revised edition. And the idea of this chart is just to show how conspiracies, uh, conspiracy theories can move up from relatively benign 
silly little things to things that are very dangerous and hard to break people out of. Um, it's also important to know there's a difference between conspiracies and conspiracy theories. Conspiracies are things that did actually happen. Conspiracy theories are things that have not yet been proven to have happened. But the bottom of this chart, grounded re in reality, are, are actual conspiracies that, that happened. And then slowly moving up, it goes through this, you know, I don't know, we have some questions about these things to more into the actual hardcore defending conspiracy theories and then up into really dangerous, hard to break out of, potential for violence type areas. Excellent uh, chart, recommend looking it up. Also recommend Abby's TikTok. She does really great work on TikTok. Back to Barkin. So Barkin's idea of stigmatized knowledge was a combination of something called rejected knowledge by James Webb and the cultic milieu by Colin Campbell. And so this refers to uh, claims of truth that have been rejected or ignored by institutions that are relied upon for validating such claims. So things that universities, museums, um, laboratories, government institutions have rejected or ignored. And the skepticism that conspiracy theorists hold towards these knowledge validating institutions is itself a basic type of conspiracy theory. And these institutions, these individuals within these institutions are believed to be connected through these webs of, of deceptions or secrets. And they're trying to protect a truth that the conspiracy theorists are trying to reveal. Um, and a focus on knowledge claims uh, means that stigmatized knowledge is actually more inclusive of a broader range of conspiracy theories than just conspiracy theory. That is a very, very basic, very fast uh, overview of Michael Barkin's idea of stigmatized knowledge. This is the book that it comes from. Again, highly recommend it if you're interested in learning more about conspiracy theories, um, especially within the United States. Um, excellent book, written very accessibly, um, an enjoyable read. And so Barkin identified five varieties of stigmatized knowledge, forgotten knowledge, superseded knowledge, ignored knowledge, rejected knowledge, suppressed knowledge. So these are um, referring to these claims of truth, these conspiracy theories say they have this truth, but you know, the university has uh, ignored it or that scientist at the Smithsonian has suppressed this knowledge. The Smithsonian, very popular target for pseudo-archeology, span especially with regards to giants. Um, often said that Smithsonian scientists are hiding truth or suppressing the truth of, of giants. They have giant skeletons in their collections. That's a popular uh, argument. Forgotten knowledge um, can refer to ancient Atlantean knowledge, um, that kind of thing. And just as some examples of how these look, how these claims of stigmatized knowledge look within pseudo-archaeology, America on Earth was a television show. I think they have four seasons hosted by this geologist, Scott Walter. And right in the opening credits, he's starting to, to cast some doubt. Um, he's talking about history that we are taught is wrong. There's a hidden history. Sometimes it's not what we've been taught. Um, so this idea of these, these claims of truth being stigmatized, being hidden away, being suppressed, being ignored. Xavier Hayes uh, in his book, Ancient Giants of the Americas, another example right here. What happens when new evidence threatens to upend universally accepted theory? Most of the time it's ridiculed, swept under the rug or flat out ignored. And finally, an example from probably the most famous of all pseudo archeological books, Chariots of the Gods. This is where uh, most of ancient alien or ancient astronaut theory comes from. The, the show Ancient Aliens inspired by this book. Uh, and he says, Von Daniken says, it took courage to write this book and it will take courage to read it because his theories and proofs do not fit into the mosaic of traditional archeology. span So again, painting this picture of being at odds with the archeological span establishments or the mainstream archeologists that were trying to perhaps hide or suppress this knowledge. These are just a few examples of how stigmatized knowledge looks within pseudo-archeology span or appears within pseudo-archeology. Span um, once you see it, you can't unsee it. It'll just kind of pop out everywhere. And that's why I say that stigmatized knowledge to me is, is the most important characteristic or part of this definition. And Barkin and Douglas, I sort of touched on this already. Um, believers in one form of stigmatized knowledge are likely to believe in other forms, including paranormal phenomena, like we sort of talked about at the very beginning. So that is how I came up with this definition 
of pseudoarchaeology, the three parts into this definition in a very quick, brief overview. You're welcome to email me if you're, you want more information. I'm on social media a lot, I'm talking about this stuff a lot. So if you'd like to learn more in-depth information, let me know. But for now, keeping it brief for this presentation. So how do we identify pseudoarchaeology? What are you looking for? Um, Fagan, again, has identified uh, 11 diagnostic characteristics. Three he called characteristics of attitude, eight are characteristics of procedure. So when you're reading, show, uh, reading books or magazines or papers or websites, maybe you're watching a show or you're watching a documentary about archeology, span um, these are sort of characteristics, excuse me, that you're gonna look for. That'll help you think maybe, you know, I need to sort of critically analyze this just a little bit more. Um, and I'll just very quickly go over these very text heavy slides. I'm sorry, I couldn't really find a great picture for it. But the characteristics of attitude, so dogged adherence to outdated theoretical models. Ultimately, you know, archaeology once had this theory, more information over time has led us to revise our theories to, to move on and leave that old theory behind. Pseudo-archaeologists jump on that old theory um, because archaeologists have rejected it. So maybe there's something in there that these pseudo-archaeologists should pay attention to. That's just one example. Um, pseudo-archaeologists hate academia, yet at the same time, they're like desperate for academic approval. It's kind of funny. We're the mainstream. Um, archaeologists are, are not even just um, academic archaeologists, um, but archaeologists are just you know, seen as these really terrible person, people who are in it for the money, sometimes in it to protect our reputations. And so these pseudo-archaeologists really don't like us. And yet they also really want our approval. They want us to um, put them on the same page as, as academic or, or other archaeology. So it's kind of this, this funny about face that happens sometimes. I don't really have a great example to use here, but just something I see, especially on social media in the conversations with pseudo-archaeologists. Um, it's kind of funny. Characteristics of procedure. So they make big claims without enough evidence or verifiable evidence. They cherry pick or distort facts. So it's not that pseudo-archaeologists don't use facts. They just cherry pick and pull them right out of that context and combine them with other cherry picked facts to create a new story. Um, something called the kitchen sink method. So, or I've heard this referred to as fire hosing sometimes where you're essentially overwhelming the audience with information. They use, they pull so many cherry picked facts from so many different areas, more than really what's necessary, um, in part to give the impression of a very well researched book. If you look at like, you know, Graham Hancock's books or David Wilcox's book, they're, they're big books, um, hundreds of pages. But they're also counting on their audience not being willing to challenge so many claims from so many different fields. Um, that's what uh, Fagan refers to as the kitchen sink. Uh, Pseudoarchaeology also only gives very vague definitions of concepts, which makes it easier for them to twist it into something else. Uh, they actually really like to play around with rhetoric and semantics, um, which is also something I see a lot of in the far-right uh, far extremism, which I will be talking about later, this just playing around with rhetoric and semantics. They make sloppy comparisons of sites, of, of belongings, features, just ultimately making connections out of nothing. There's this weird obsession with esoterica or occult knowledge within uh, pseudo-archaeology, this uh, secret knowledge that is hidden in texts or encoded into pyramids, for example, um, which I guess fits in with this idea of conspiracy theorists holding on to this special knowledge. There's logical fallacies all throughout it. Um, and it hypes up, pseudo-archaeology sort of hypes up the idea of a grand reward at the end of all the speculation. You're kind of going on this journey and digging through all these different things to come to some big, grand, important conclusion. Again, just very brief overview. Highly recommend Garrett's uh, chapter. Very good book. So this is something I hear a lot when I'm talking about Atlantis or extraterrestrials or, I don't know, Egyptians settling in the Grand Canyon. Um, these theories at the surface seem very silly and very outlandish um, and very goofy. 
So I, a lot of people say, you know, nobody actually believes in this stuff. How can anybody possibly believe in this stuff? Why are you wasting your time with it? The truth is that people do believe. Uh, again, looking at the Chapman survey of American fears from 2018, we can see that 57% of Americans believe in things like Atlantis, these ancient, highly advanced civilizations. Uh, and 41% believe in ancient extraterrestrial visits to the Earth. Those are big numbers, and those have actually risen dramatically since the survey began in, I believe, 2014. Um, they've each risen like well over 10%. Um, so people do believe. And knowing that people believe, now we need to think about what are the messages being passed through pseudo-archaeology? What are people being told? What are people being convinced of? Um, a predominant purpose of conspiracy theories is to create doubt in the mind of its audience. It's not to give new facts. It's just to make you doubt what you're seeing or what you're reading. Um, so that way, an alternative message can be pushed in. Pseudo-archaeological theories have racism at their core. Um, they exist to cast doubt on the achievements, the ancient achievements of, of certain cultures, certain people, really anyone who's not from a Western European country, which is often equated as the, or viewed as the seat of civilization and often equated with white. Um, and because of this doubt, casting this doubt, pseudo-archaeology has actually become a useful tool for far-right extremists like white nationalists and neo-Nazis, uh, both historically and contemporarily. Uh, I wrote an article for Sapiens, you can find it online, about how white nationalists and neo-Nazis use pseudo-archaeology. It's a short article, I didn't have a lot of room to get into the details, um, but ultimately theories about Atlantis are very popular uh, with neo-Nazis and white nationalists because Atlantis has often been linked to this idea of ancient white Aryans. Um, the Solutrean hypothesis is another archaeological theory that uh, has been widely discredited by archaeology, but is just enormously popular within pseudo or within white nationalism. Um, and it's because these theories cast doubt and they become useful for white nationalists who are trying to prove something called the Great Replacement Theory. It's a conspiracy theory that suggests that uh, there is a special white race of people nearing extinction and this white race needs to be protected. Far-right extremists need to find some sort of evidence to, to ultimately prove that true, um, to prove that they have this long heritage, in, in this case, in the United States uh, or Canada. And archaeology is a very powerful tool for heritage. Um, it gives you something tangible that you can see, that you can hold on to, uh, that acts as, as proof. So archaeology becomes a very powerful tool for legitimization. Um, and pseudo-archaeology is viewed as legitimate but stigmatized archaeology. So these far-right nationalists uh, or extremists don't think it's it's fake or silly archaeology. Um, they view it as legitimate, just stigmatized. And so that's why pseudo-archaeology um, becomes a very powerful tool for uh, far-right extremism. And I will talk a little bit more about that in a bit. Uh, but if you are interested in learning more about the far-right use of things, especially of Atlantis, uh, looking at this book, Black Sun, this other book, Gods of the Blood, very good books, very informative books about the history of occultism in particular um, in relation to far-right extremism, but through that is where you get a lot of the pseudo-archaeology. Um, and if you want to look at pseudo-archaeology within a very specific far-right movement, Religion and the Racist Right, it's about the origins of the Christian identity movement, which is um, right now very connected to a lot of the far-right extremism in the United States. Uh, and they have a lot of pseudo-archaeology within their uh, founding beliefs, a lot of pyramidism in particular. Uh, anyway, highly recommend these books. Um, very informative if you're interested in learning more. So back to this slide. If you're interested in studying pseudo-archaeology and gender, looking at the far right, um, I think would be my number one suggestion of an area to focus on. Highly re relevant. Um, there's a lot going on right now with regards to the far right and uh, gender and sexual identities um, in the United States in particular. It is here in Canada. It has always been here in Canada, but it's very much being emboldened by what we're seeing south of the border. And so within Canada, it's going to start to get worse. It's going to rise. Um, so 
I would say, like I say, if you're interested in studying pseudoarchaeology and gender, this would be an area that I think would be number one on my list of, of areas to focus on. And I will explain that in a moment. Just going into pseudoarchaeology and gender now, as I mentioned, there's so many different ways to think about it. And none of these, to the best of my knowledge, have been explored. I think it's an area that really needs some eyes on it. I think it would be so interesting. Um, highly recommend people take it up. And there's these are sort of just some of the questions I could think of that you could ask. Like I said, there's so many different ways you could take it. So these are just some areas I was kind of um, musing about. You could example examine very specific pseudo-archaeological theories involving gender or sexuality on a case-by-case -case basis. Just, you know, maybe go on to TikTok actually is a great area that also needs more attention on it. Um, watch some TikTok videos and deconstruct those. That's something you could do. Um, you could ask questions about gender differences in the proponents of pseudo-archaeology. Who is writing the books? Who is filming the shows? Who is getting the interviews? Who's going on speaking tours, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, in my experience, in my observations, it is overwhelmingly men, um, but it's not just men. And similarly, you could look at, are there gender differences in pseudo-archaeology audiences um, in the people who believe in these theories, adhere to these theories? Um, I think that would also be something very interesting to look at, excuse me, especially thinking about uh, specific theories. So I tend to see uh, Atlantis, for example, in Lemuria pop up in a lot of typically feminist spaces. So I think that would be kind of interesting to explore. Um, another question, if pseudo-archaeology already erodes trust in archaeology and archaeologists or cast doubt on us, how might gender differences in pseudo-archaeology also contribute to an erosion of trust specifically in archaeologists of marginalized genders or even in subdisciplines like feminist and queer archaeology? Uh, so how would pseudo-archaeology potentially impact these spaces and make it more difficult for um, marginalized archaeologists to be uh, taken seriously. Related to point number three, uh, confronting pseudo-archaeology can put the confronter, for example, an archaeologist uh, who's writing a paper or social media thread or filming a video, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it can often put us at risk for harassment, serious harassment, or worse. And I say this as someone who has experienced um, serious targeted harassment by people who really don't like to be challenged, um, more than once I've had uh, far right figures target me uh, on Twitter, on Reddit. I ended up on a men's rights activist website once, which was also kind of weird. So anyway, I have experience with this. Definitely not an enjoyable time. Um, it sucks. <laughs> to put it bluntly, it sucks. But are there gender differences in the people who are doing the harassing? And are there gender differences in the types of harassment that uh, marginalized folks uh, face versus non-marginalized folks? So uh, I, through again, through my experience and observation, the types of harassment that I receive as a woman are different than uh, my colleagues who are men. But there's been nothing really um, in-depth examined, nothing done in-depth uh, regarding this topic. So these are just a few of the questions that I was sort of thinking about as suggested areas for research if you're interested in this, uh, in pursuing our pseudo-archaeology in gender. But as I mentioned earlier, I think that the number one area to focus on right now would be pseudo-archaeology, gender, and the far right. Um, and this is due to the dramatic increase in extreme right far, uh, extreme far right political power in North America over the past five-ish years. I mean, it's been around for so, so long since these countries, since the United States was founded, since Canada was founded, um, it is ultimately part of that founding. But over the past five-ish years, it's really, really intensified, especially in the United States. And right now, there is currently an extremely strong focus on gender and sexual identities. The far right is really targeting this. Um, and as a result, it's kind of an area where I'm expecting to see an increased appearance of pseudo-archaeology. I haven't looked into this. It's just, again, me speculating based on my observations and my research to date. Um, but far-right extremists are searching for historical connections to justify these contemporary ideologies or beliefs they have about gender and sexuality. 
as I had sort of previously touched on, heritage is very important to the far right. And again, just reminding, archaeology is a tool for legitimization. It can potentially give scientific proof to something. Pseudo-archaeology viewed as legitimate, but stigmatized archaeology, and therefore within the far right, who are looking to prove these theories that don't have, um, that really don't have that archaeological knowledge, they don't have that actual legitimate heritage, um, they turn to pseudo-archaeology, which becomes then a tool for legitimization. It just happens to be viewed as stigmatized knowledge. So this report came out uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, and it is a very, very good report. Um, if you're interested in pseudo-archaeology and gender, or gender within gender and sexuality within far-right ideologies, I highly recommend this report as a starting point. Um, it gives a very, very good overview of what's going on. Uh, massive content warnings, of course. There's some pretty uh, awful imagery in there, pretty awful text. But this author, she does a really great job of um, giving you a little bit of background information on the general far right, um, their views towards gender and sexuality. Um, she focuses on a specific far right movement, but does say that it's more applicable to all far right groups. Um, but ultimately, the obsession the extreme far right has with gender and sexual identities is linked to racism and anti Semitism, um, which should not be a surprise. And far right extremists. They adhere, as I previously mentioned, to something called the Great Replacement Conspiracy Theory. That is where I have seen a lot of archaeology, or I mean, well, archaeology too, but a lot of pseudo-archaeology used. Um, it appears there a lot. Many far-right extremists also be believe in conspiracy theories about cultural Marxism that suggest Jewish elites are secretly the ones who are pushing this agenda to exterminate and replace white people. And one way the far right believes they can protect white people, again, within this idea of great replacement conspiracy theory, um, is through strict gender and family roles. So they've come up with this um, traditional idea of a traditional nuclear family in which it is only white, cis, heterosexual people. So this report ultimately finds that any sexuality or gender that falls outside of cis and hetero is seen as a direct threat to white people. Um, and again, some far right movements believe that it's Jewish elites who are pushing these sexualities, um, these gender constructions onto uh, society. That's the anti-Semitism part. Feminism is believed to subvert traditional gender roles of feminine women and masculine men. Therefore, it is viewed as a threat. The far right really hates feminism. Um, and for the same reasons, they also really hate um, LGBTQ2S people and communities also viewed as threats um, because they are seen to subvert these traditional gender roles. And Crawford ultimately concludes, much like what I've been saying here, that more research into this is needed. More research into extreme far-right hatred towards anyone determined to be violating strict constructions of gender and sexuality is urgently needed. And she points out that this areas of research that are needed includes the intersection of these ideologies with other far-right ideologies, neo-Nazism, for example. Um, where is the far-right getting their ideologies from or these beliefs from? And how are they mainstreaming these beliefs and ideologies and, and through that attracting new people to these ideologies? So where are they sneaking it in? And so when I was reading this report, something that I started thinking about is how pseudo-archaeology uh, can also be examined within this um, framework that Blythe Crawford has provided in this report. And thinking about pseudo-archaeology being used as a legitimization tool and so therefore studying the use of pseudo-archaeology in specific relation to construction and maintenance of far-right ideologies concerning gender and sexuality is a really important avenue for research. Um, and it could lend some really serious insight into better understanding general far-right concepts regarding um, gender and sexuality uh, by looking at, you know, what is, how is pseudo-archaeology being used to support these beliefs um, or to invent these beliefs? that kind of thing. Um, and it could, through better understanding these beliefs um, or more thoroughly understanding these ideologies, these concepts, it just contributes to work uh, that will hopefully prevent further hatred and violence against um, targeted marginalized people and communities. 
So that is an area, that is why I say that this area is something I would highly recommend somebody look into if you're interested in uh, pursuing pseudo-archaeology and gender research. Um, and that is the end. Thank you so much for your time and attention. Thank you to Kevin for inviting me to give this talk. Uh, and if you have any more questions about anything, please do not hesitate um, to get in touch with me. Thanks.